know, certainty is great, but it's hard to come by legitimately. Like at times we're having to cram reality into categories and containers that it just doesn't fit into. Now another way of putting it is that most days we live in the probable world. Will you wait too long to start that paper? Probably. Will you have to rush somewhere and you end up spilling your coffee on your shirt? Probably. You might, given a preponderance of evidence, think that it's likely that you will arrive at your important meeting with a big old stain on your shirt, but you can't be certain. Now, we're going to cover the basics of inductive reasoning today, and in order to do that, we have to talk about the parts that go into inductive reasoning before we jump into talking about necessary and sufficient conditions, enumerative arguments, and finally, talking about causal arguments. So with that in mind, let's jump into it. Inductive arguments are largely those arguments that require us to be both more general and more specific. Deductive reasoning gets us closest to certainty and clarity, but it's very severely limited in scope. We can only talk about what is the case in the argument itself, and we can't consider a lot of empirical data or statistical trends when we consider validity and soundness. Now, compared to deductive reasoning, inductive reasoning seems squishier. It's not based on validity or invalidity, but on probability. When an inductive argument works, that is, when an inductive argument's premises are most strongly related to its conclusion, we say that it is probable or strong. When such a relation is not present, we say it's improbable or weak. And on top of that, when we have premises of a valid deductive argument that are all true, we say that they're sound. But in an inductive argument, we say that those, that argument is cogent. So, for example, let's say that you say something like 85% of people getting packages delivered in this city have had their packages taken from their porch. My friend Sam lives in that city, so it's likely that he's had a package stolen. And you would be making an inductive argument in that case that is strong based on the premises it can't really be cogent because we're not dealing with accurate data. We don't have a specific city in mind. We don't have specific information. But by and large, it is a strong argument. Now, because this argument is using made-up premises, it can't really be cogent. But if I were relying on accurate data from a very specific urban context, it could be a cogent argument as well. With this example, we're beginning from a general set of admittedly made-up statistics and moving on to inferences about individual members of a group. Now, if we reverse this, that is, if we look at the information from a few members of a group and infer reasonable conclusions on the basis of available information about the group as a whole, we're practicing something called an enumerative argument. Enumerative inferences are those argument patterns that begin with observations about some members of a group and end up with a generalization about all of them. So for example, if both you and a roommate drive a Nissan Rogue and both of you notice that in your respective vehicles you have sunglasses holders on the ceiling of the vehicle, you might be able to reasonably infer that it's highly probable that all Nissan Rogues have the same feature. You couldn't be certain because you don't have every single available Nissan Rogue to test, but you'd be very, very probably correct. The enumerative inference focuses on a target population or a target group which is distinguished from everyone else. In the case of the Nissan Rogue, it would be a target group of you and your roommate, provided that you and your roommate both have the same vehicle. In order to make careful inferences, we have to have a group of people, objects, or behaviors that can be classified 
into a group of something. And we have to be able to make arguments about them that are reasonable in order to avoid a fallacy known as the hasty generalization. Now, the individual members of a target group that we observe are called sample members, or simply the sample. And both the sample members and the target population are being examined in relation to some relevant property. Here we have the different groups that we're trying to form together into a relation, or put differently, a relation that we are trying to make explicit, as in the relation's already there, we're just trying to highlight it. Many political arguments about opposing political parties use weak enumerative inferences to make general claims that are likely untrue or uncogent. A Tottenham fan might say that since Chelsea supporters in the past were deeply racist and anti-Semitic, that all supporters are likely racist or anti-Semitic, and they're making a very weak argument. Or, for example, anybody who likes Wario is a supporter of white-collar crime. While this might technically be true, it could also very likely be the case that people just like, I don't know, a squiggly mustache and uh, the yellow and purple color attire that um, Wario likes to wear as opposed to the more traditional dress of his, uh, you know, plumber adversaries. In both of these cases, we have examples of enumerative arguments that fall prey to the two main pitfalls of enumerative inductions. They either have too small a sample size, or they don't have a representative sample size. If you only sampled people who liked Wario already and were trying to recruit you into their pyramid scheme, you'd likely not have a sample group that is representative of the total number of people who like Mario, or Wario for that matter. Um, this brings us to one of the chief culprits of weak inductive arguments, a hasty generalization. Even if your sample group is representative of the larger target population, they might still be too small of a sample size to make reasonable conclusions. When someone infers a general rule on the basis of a very small sample size, they are committing the hasty generalization fallacy. Think about it this way. Imagine that you have a box of chewy granola bars that come in an equal assortment of flavors. You pull out three bars from the box and they're all s'mores flavored, right? It's great for camping, it's terrible for lunches. You might infer that you're being lied to by big granola who's too busy trying to get you to buy those gross warm-up like cups of microwave granola instead of really focusing on quality control and delivering to you your equal assortment of granola bars. But as you keep pulling out bars, you realize that you inferred a general rule about the contents of the box that don't really reflect reality. You just happen to pull out three s'mores flavored bars in one go, the box is fine, your brain is not. When we are identifying or creating our own enumerative inferences, we need to be careful that we don't assume that the sample we're drawing from uh, is more representative than it really is, right? One successful person from an historically excluded or disempowered group does not mean that such exclusion or disempowerment doesn't exist, although this is exactly the type of argument that you hear trotted out about that all the time. You have to have reasonable and accurate sample sizes and sample groups that are representative of the larger group as a whole. Otherwise, you're going to have very weak, if not fallacious, enumerative arguments. Now, when we turn our attention to causal arguments, that same level of care will need to carry over. Causal arguments are those arguments that we make when we're trying to claim that something caused another thing to happen, whether it's St. Thomas Aquinas' famous listicle, Five Ways God is Real, actually, or some dumb arguments on Reddit about 5G giving you parasites that you can cure by eating chia seeds, causal arguments usually end up being inductive arguments. Now, these causal arguments can take 
some pretty familiar forms, most notably the form that scientists use when they are engaged in experimentation. They are trying to arrive at the best explanation. And so what they do is they gather data and they check it against data gathered by their peers and they eventually reach the explanation that best explains most of the data and what's happening there. Now, having reliable peer-reviewed uh, data is great, but what happens if you don't have that level of data for your everyday inferences? Well, our good buddy John Stuart Mill has some tips that will help us with this. For Mill, we can begin by using what he calls the method of agreement, which is where we look to see if more than one occurrence of a phenomena has a relevant factor in common. And we can use the method of difference to see if that relevant factor is present when a phenomenon occurs, but it's absent when it doesn't occur. So for example, it might be the case where when your roommate is around, the snacks that you bought at the store are always somehow out, but when your roommate is on vacation, your snacks last throughout the whole week you might be able to make a reasonable inference that your roommate is eating your food. This would be using Mill's method of difference as an example, right? Or another example might be that you have a friend who you want, who always wants to come over and play, I don't know, like Halo, uh, and will play Halo with you all the time, but when you ask if they'll come over and help you with physics, homework, somehow they're gone. It's Mill's method of, uh, method of difference at work again. Now, Mill says that we can also combine these methods to identify the relevant factors common to occurrences of a phenomena we're observing and to discard any that are present even when there are no occurrences of the phenomena. Now, we also need to be mindful that when we are making these kinds of inferences for causal relations, we need to be careful that we don't fall into some similar pitfalls. So for example, we might uh, assume that there is causation when really all we have is correlation, that two phenomena are occurring in a similar proximity to one another or at a similar time, but they're not necessarily related to one another. Or we might assume that certain factors are relevant or irrelevant and don't give us data that actually connects a uh, connects two phenomena when in reality they do. So we need to be mindful of confusing cause with correlation and we need to be mindful that we pay attention to which factors are actually relevant. And this is not just true of causal arguments, this is true of all arguments, right? It might be the case that we think that something is a relevant factor when in reality it's not. And to confuse a relevant factor with an irrelevant one, well, that's the red herring fallacy, right? We're assuming that something matters when it doesn't matter for the type of relation we are trying to establish. Now, finally, when we're thinking about causal relations and arguments in general, we need to think about necessary and sufficient causes. That is, we need to consider which factors need to be present for a thing to happen at all, and which factors guarantee that a thing will happen. Necessary conditions are those factors which need to be present for an event to occur at all. So for example, if you're gonna fly, necessary conditions would be a pilot, a landing strip, a, a, a you know full tank of fuel, um, the plane itself, right? You need all of these things in order to fly, but the sufficient conditions to guarantee that you are flying are probably when you are going up into the air and the pilot says we are all clear for takeoff and you're actually taking off. Yeah, you need to have all of those necessary conditions, but those necessary conditions are not sufficient to guarantee that you are going to fly. Maybe another example that's closer to home would be helpful. 
a lot of times if you want to bake something, you ha don't have what you need readily available. So you have to go out and you have to get your ingredients. And you go to the store and let's say you want to make chocolate chip cookies or something. So you buy your flour and you buy your chocolate chips and you buy your sugar and your other elements that you need for making them. And you get all these items together and you put them on your kitchen counter and you don't make cookies. Why? Because all of those elements are necessary to make something, but they are not sufficient. They're not going to guarantee that you do a thing. Anybody who's ever worked on any creative project and has spent as much, if not more, of their energy on gathering the right pen and the right notebook to write the, you know, great existential novel of all time or who spends all their time going through Reverb.com trying to find the best guitar pedal that will get the perfect tone for their song that's going to change the world are engaged in maybe necessary but certainly not sufficient conditions to create anything. Identifying which conditions are crucial for determining whether or not something will happen or has ways needed to possibly happen is what we're dealing with here, right? Having all the tools does not guarantee you're going to build that house, right? We need to be mindful that what is sufficient and what is necessary are not the same thing. And so we can't assume that necessary conditions will allow us to infer causation even as they are necessary. These inductive arguments are part of our everyday way of existing in the world. We assume that we know what causes what to happen even when we're wrong. And we can draw conclusions based on an incredibly small sample size. But we can also carefully sift through the reliable data we do have and draw reasonable conclusions like vaccines are good, cell towers don't give you parasites, and Wario does not in fact have an incredible opportunity that you can get in on the ground floor of regardless of how soft the leggings are that he's got sitting in his dirty garage. But your inferences might be different. Adios.